Uh, so in just a minute, we'd like to bring on Mike Lynch, who many of you probably know from WCCO. And uh, he's been... <laughs> He's been uh, putting on star parties for oh, a couple few years. Oh, about 40 or so, give or take. Okay. Yeah. And uh, so he's here to help make the uh, stars of the Avon Hills your old friends. So thank you All very right. much. Thank Mike. you, John. Thank you. I'm used to doing this program at night, so I hope I'm okay here. Well, it's so nice to be up here, and what an honor it is to be at St. John's University and to be at your conference here. And, uh, ooh, I'm overfeeding here. I should know that being in radio. I can't get too close to speakers. But uh, as I tell people at my star parties that I love to do, welcome to my passion. I've been doing these, like I said, for over 40 years. Now, in my other life, I'm a meteorologist at WCCO Radio. Now, y'all listen to WCCO Radio, right? Hey, I thought so. No. <laughs> I've been doing that for 31 years. And you know what that proves, being a weatherman for 31 years? Crime does pay. Yes, yes it does. Well, it's been a bit challenging lately. Uh, it really looked to me like that storm uh, that was uh, supposedly heading in on Sunday was really going to raise cane, but it obviously changed and uh, we got a little hoodwinked and looks like there'll be a little snow in northern Minnesota. But having said that, uh, there, there's a system coming in on Tuesday that bears watching. Uh, it's coming out of the Rockies, and it's, it's a different kind of animal than the one before. So uh, uh, right now, if you put a gun to my head, I would say the, probably the best chance of heaviest snow is going to be in central Minnesota. But again, these tracks change all the time. So that's enough weather. This is what I love to talk about. I love to talk about stars. Uh, how many of you have done a lot of star watching? It's fun, isn't it? Yes. How many of you live in the countryside? Oh, that's, oh I'm so envious of you. Well, like, like, like John said, I've been doing this a long time. This is a picture of me in my very first telescope. Uh, this was back in 1970, and I had been helping my mentor and uh, my mentor, my hero, Wenzel Franzik, put on these moon watches at the Woodlake Nature Center in Richfield, where I grew up across the street from. And he helped me build this first telescope here. Uh, things have changed a little bit since then. This is uh, now what I have. I call this Big Daddy. Oops, I, I, I went too fast there. And, uh, well, I'm a geek then. Uh, I was a geek then and I'm a geek now, but I got bigger telescopes. So I've been doing these Star Watch parties all around the uh, Twin Cities and Minnesota, western Wisconsin. Yet to do one in Iowa or, uh, or uh, South Dakota, North Dakota, but I absolutely love doing these. And, and one of the things I like to do, of course, the main thing I like to do is go out and show people the stars. And I've got all kinds of tools to do it. I've got this uh, literally wicked laser pointer here that I can use. And uh, this is what I use to show stars in the sky. And I love showing constellations and then we like looking through the telescope. But uh, before we go outside, I like to do a little bit of orientation uh, for star watching. And hopefully it'll help you guys the next time it's clear. And it's supposed to be clear for at least a little while tonight. Now, do you guys all have star maps in your packages for March? I think you do. I think you do. And if you do, I might need to borrow one because I don't have one up on stage with me. I don't need it right now, but maybe later. All right. Well, what I'd like to do here is a little bit of orientation. This is what I normally do when I do a Star Watch party. We start out inside for a little bit, and then we go outside, and I help you make the stars your old friends. And also, I've written a book, Mike Lish's Minnesota Star Watch, and I just happen to have some copies of that in the Great Hall. And uh, I, I have them for sale for $15. I'll be here till about noon today. And uh, if you want, I can uh, sign the book and, 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 and further desecrate it if you want. There's a machine signing in there. But I'd love to meet with you, and I've already met with some of you. And, and uh, it's a lot of fun. Also, I write a, a column, a star watching column for the St. Paul Pioneer Press. And I've been doing that since 1998. Can you tell I'm into this? It's fun. All right, well, let's just talk. Oh, another thing I love to do is I, 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 uh, I do astrophotography. I take pictures in the stars. Now, maybe some of you saw the, uh, the, the slides that were running before the actual uh, program began. Some of those shots are mine, and astrophotography is so much fun. And the way the technology is going, heck, you can hold up a cell phone and, and find your way around the nighttime sky. It's not going to be too long before you can buy a telescope that has an imager built into it, that is a camera that will allow you to take astrophotography and, and to take pictures on your own. And it's amazing what you can see. 
Uh, the limitation with just looking through a telescope, and looking through a telescope is great, don't get me wrong, you see things like Saturn and, and star clusters and whatnot, it's great. But the limitation is not the telescope, it's our eyes and our brains. We can look through the biggest telescope in the world, but the camera is always going to get a better image and better colors and better resolution, mainly better colors and, 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 and resolution because uh, it can accumulate light. Our brains are, and eyes, our brains can only accumulate so much light at once. Whereas if you have an imager, it can take like a 30 minute uh, shot. It's, it's amazing what you can see. But like I say, there's still a lot of good stuff you can see through, uh, uh, through the telescope visually. And believe it or not, that's a camera. That it's called a CCD camera. But there's lots of other ways to do it. Well, let's talk stars here. What are stars? They're like me, basically big balls of gas, all right? very big balls of gas and and they're mainly made up of hydrogen zillions and zillions of individual hydrogen atoms crammed together in these giant balls of gas of course stars have many other elements within them but it, they're mostly balls of hydrogen gas now the closest star we have to our sun the closest well, i just gave it away the closest star we have to the earth is the sun the sun's an average star uh there's a lot of stars that are bigger there's a lot of stars that are smaller way bigger than anything else in our our uh in our solar system of course here's the earth this little dot here's jupiter and of course jupiter is so big you could fit 1300 earths inside and then look how much bigger the sun is speaking of jupiter and the planets have you seen those two bright stars in the western sky in the early evening? Have you seen those? You can't miss them. Go out there and, and they're getting closer and closer together. Those aren't stars. Those are the planets Venus and Jupiter. Venus is the brighter one on the lower right. And they've been getting closer and closer and closer together since Christmas. And on March 13th, they're only gonna be about three degrees apart. They're gonna be right next to each other. They're super bright and they're gonna make a lovely, lovely sight. Now, how many of you have binoculars? A lot of people have binoculars. Take a look at Jupiter. Even though Venus is brighter, Venus isn't much to look at. Venus is completely cloud covered. Uh, it's got a, a poisonous cloud cover of, of made up of carbon dioxide and carbon monoxide. There's acid rain and underneath the clouds, it's like 800 degrees. It's not a good place to go for the weekend, but it's very dull to look at through a telescope because basically all you see is just a white disc. Although it does change shapes like the moon does, it goes through a, a, a gibbous phase and a waxing phase, but eh, that's not all that interesting. Jupiter, on the other hand, is cool to look at. Jupiter, you'll be able to resolve the disk of the planet. Now, Jupiter is dimmer because it's so much farther away. It's like 500 million miles away, but it's huge. It's, it's 88,000 miles in diameter, way bigger than the Earth. But the thing you can see, even with a pair of binoculars, if you look at Jupiter, you'll see little tiny star-like objects either side of it that are lined up. And they're always changing their positions. And you can see up to four of them. And the reason you can see up to four of them is that those are Jupiter's brightest moons and they orbit around the planet. And they're kind of fun to see. Every night they're in a different configuration. In fact, they can change uh, from hour to hour through the night. So take a look at that. And if you have a telescope, you might even see some of uh, Jupiter's cloud bands. But again, look at Jupiter and Venus in the uh, western sky. And also, there's another planet on the rise, as long as I'm talking planets, Mars. I I'm giving you an assignment already here, all right? So you're gonna look at Venus and Jupiter, right? You promised me you're gonna do that. And then in the evening, about eight o'clock, I want you to look in the eastern, southeastern sky for the brightest star-like object you can see, more in the east than the southeast. And it has a distinctive reddish glow to it to the naked eye. You know what that is? That's Mars. And, it, and that really, really shows up well. Mars is the closest it's been to Earth in about two years, a little over two years. But Mars is only 4,000 miles in diameter and it's 63 million miles away. So you're not gonna see a lot of detail on Mars. But if you have a good pair of binoculars or a halfway decent telescope, take a look at Mars. Now, most telescopes, when you look through them, give you an inverted image, upside down image, and that's normal. Assuming yours does, look at Mars after about nine or 10 o'clock especially, let it get high up in the sky. You'll see the disk of Mars. You may see some dark markings on it, but look on the lower edge of the disk and it may have kind of a whitish tinge to it. That's the, pla that's the planet Mars's north polar cap. So see if you can spot that. Now I want a 10 page report from all of you after you do this, okay? All right, 
I'm kind of, I'm having fun here. All right, now, the sun, 93 million miles away. Well, I'm at school, I have to give homework. Uh, 93 million miles away, it's 864,000 miles in diameter. It's way heavier than anything else uh, around the solar system. 300,000 times the mass of the Earth and uh, 300,000 times heavier than the Earth. And because of that, it has a lot more gravitational pull. Mass, the more mass you have, the more gravitational pull you have. 10,000 degrees at the surface, but it's much hotter inside. And there's all kinds of ways you can talk about the power of the sun, comparing it with nuclear bombs. I don't like to do that. I like light bulbs. Uh, now, I haven't figured out the new energy efficient light bulbs, but every single second the sun produces the energy of about a trillion, trillion, 100 watt light bulbs. It's been doing that for about 5 billion years, and it's going to do so for about another 5 billion years. It's good our sun is not that big, because the bigger you are, the bigger ball of gas you are, the, uh, you don't live all that long. The, the, the smaller you are, the longer you live. The big ones are gas guzzlers. All right, what makes the sun shine? Yeah, it's the same thing that makes all the rest of the stars shine. Let me ask you this. Just because you're a big ball of hydrogen gas, does that entitle you to be a star and produce light and energy? Just because you're a big ball of gas, a huge ball of gas, does it? How many say yes? How many say no? How many say yes? <laughs> Those who were courageous enough to raise their hands and say yes are right. You need to be a big, massive ball of gas to produce, uh, to produce starlight and to produce energy. That's because the ultimate physical source of the sun's energy or that of any other star is, you ready for this? Gravity, all right? And to have a gravitational pull, you need lots of mass, right? So you need to be a big, massive ball of gas. Let me explain how it works a little bit, briefly. I'm, I'm not gonna go into physics 101 here. All right, now the sun, because it's so much more massive than the earth, has all that gravitational pull, you know, all the planets go around the sun, uh, most of the asteroids, some of the comets. I mean, it runs things gravitationally because it's so big. But the sun is so massive that the very ball of gas we call our sun is being squeezed by its own gravity. This giant ball of gas is being squeezed. And what happens is that the pressure inside that ball of gas in the middle goes up to about 500 billion pounds per square inch. How much air do you put in a bike tire? 65 pounds per square inch? This is 500 billion pounds per square inch. And when you raise the pressure up that high inside a ball of gas, you know what else goes up? The temperature. How many have ever used a pressure cooker before? Not that they're used all that much. Well, that's the same principle. And when you put air in a bike tire, the temperature of that air inside the bike tire goes up when it's pressurized. Well, in the case of the sun, it goes up to an insanely high temperature of about 27 million degrees. Now, the outer edge of the sun, the photosphere that we see is about 10,000 degrees, but it's a lot hotter inside, and that's because of gravitational pressure. And what happens with that insanely high temperature, you get a process called nuclear fusion going. Now, I'm not gonna go into the details of nuclear fusion, but here's, in essence, what happens. Because of the tremendously high heat inside of stars, these, and the pressure, these hydrogen atoms in the cores of stars are, are, are squished together in the middle. I mean, they are really packed in due to that pressure. But at the same time, with the 27 million degree temperature, they're moving around like crazy. And so they're packed together, they're moving around like crazy, they're gonna bang into each other. And there's zillions and zil zillions and zillions of these collisions every millisecond. I mean, it's like shooting two pool balls together and having them wind up being one big pool ball. Only a lot more force than that. Well, here's what happens with nuclear fusion is that the, the hydrogen atoms bash into each other so hard that they actually fuse together to form heavier helium atoms. It takes about four hydrogen atoms to make a helium atom. But the complicated part about nuclear fusion, the part I won't go into now, is that in each one of these collisions, a tiny little bit of the hydrogen is converted into tremendous amounts of energy. And the collective energy from all those collisions then moves out from the middle of the sun or any other star. And because the sun is so packed in, it can take up to a million years for the energy and the light to make it through the surface. But once it does, or make it to the surface, but once it does, we see the light and we feel the radiation. Oh, I've probably gone into a little more detail, but do you know a little bit more now about how stars shine? You see why you need to be a big ball of gas? Well, let's talk about how far away the stars are. Now this is, yeah, we all know that when we talk about the distances to the stars, we talk about their distances in 
light years. And light years are so cool because not only a unit of distance or a unit of time. Light travels at 186,300 miles a second. Let me tell you how fast that is. If you jump in an airplane and fly from Los Angeles to New York and then back to Los Angeles, and you got an airplane that can make that round trip 33 times in one second, you are traveling at the speed of light. Fast, huh? There's only one thing that travels faster than the speed of light. If you write a check, overdraw your bank account, and that check gets back to you. It's the only thing that can go faster, all right? Well, what a light year is, it's the distance that this beam of light here, this is my lower, uh, lesser travel, or oh, it's actually a dying laser beam. Uh, well, anyway, that laser beam is hitting the wall at 186,300 miles a second, all right? The light year is the distance that that laser beam would travel in a year's time going at that speed. And you can do the math, and it essentially comes down to this. You multiply the number of seconds in a year by 186,300 miles a second, right? So how many seconds are there in a year? Only 12, January 2nd, February, okay. Well, anyway, you do the math, and it turns out that one light year equals about 5.8 trillion miles, or close to 6 trillion miles. One light year is about 6 trillion miles. I'm gonna talk constellations here in just a second. Has anybody ever seen the Big Dipper? Oh, I think just about everyone has. There's a star at the end of the Big Dipper. Its traditional uh, uh, Arabic name is, is Al-Qaeda. Al Qaeda is a star we know that's about 101 light years away, and I wish I had time, but I'm not going to get into how astronomers know how far away the stars are. Uh, stars that are fairly close, though, like Al Qaeda, 101 light years away, they use something called the stellar parallax method. They take a picture of that star when the Earth is on one side of its orbit around the sun, then six months later, they take another picture of that same star when the Earth is on this side of its orbit around the sun. And the idea is that star that's fairly close by is going to change positions against the background stars in that six months. It's kind of like if you take your finger and hold it out in front of you and you shut one eye and you look where your finger is uh, in the background, where it, with reference to the background, and then you open that eye and shut the other one and you see how your finger shifted. That's called a parallax angle. And once they have that parallax angle, which is very tiny, they can figure out, using good old-fashioned trigonometry, the distances to the stars. But there's other ways to do it with more uh, distant stars. Well, anyway, al -Qaeda is 101 light years away. So, how far is a light year? Six, we're going to round it up, six trillion miles. So, it's 101 light years away, it's 606 trillion miles away. You're not getting there in a weekend. Now, you can see some stars out there with your naked eye that are thousands of light years away. And if you see a star that's thousands of light years away and you can still see it with your naked eye, what does it tell you about that star? It is a big one with a lot of luminosity. So that star Alcade at the end of the handle of Big Dipper, 101 light years away, it's 606 trillion miles away, but also if you consider time, the light that you see from it tonight left that star back in 1911, right about the time Sid Hartman put out his first column in the Star Tribune. And if you don't know who Sid Hartman is, that's okay. Believe me. Uh, but uh, so, and the thing of it is, when you look at stars that are more distant, you're looking back into more time. Astronomers have a time machine. There are some galaxies out there that are billions of light years away. Now, our galaxy that we live in is named after a candy bar. It's called the Milky Way. Now, there's about four to 500 billion stars in our Milky Way galaxy. Most of them are in the central core, and deep inside the central core, there's a huge black hole, which is the, really the collective corpses of many old, huge dead stars in the middle. Uh, the rest of the stars, like our sun, live out in these spiral arms in the case of a spiral galaxy. Our sun is about halfway from the center to the edge, from one side of the galaxy to the other, 100,000 light years across but it's only about a thousand light years thick, only a thousand light years thick. How many of you, especially in the summertime, been out and you've seen that band of light across the sky? It's the Milky Way band. Now, every single star we see up there is part of our sky, is part of our Milky Way galaxy and part of our sky, but when we look into that band, we are looking into the plane of our Milky Way galaxy. That's what we're looking into. So that's just our galaxy, but there are other galaxies out there as well. Uh, this is the uh, Bode's galaxy and the Cigar galaxy, 11 million light years away. Here are some that are about 40 million light years away. This, is, uh, this here is the Whirlpool galaxy, actually a one galaxy eating another. And uh, this is about 40 million light years away. 
And this picture here I'm going to leave you with for my little MIDI Astronomy 101 is the Hubble Ultra Deep View, the first Hubble Ultra Deep View. They took the Hubble telescope, they pointed it away from the plane of our galaxy because they didn't want to see a lot of stars in our galaxy. They left the lens open for 14 days in a row and they collected all kinds of light. Remember, the more light you collect, the better. There are very few stars in our own galaxy in this picture. Here's one, here's one, but just about everything else is another galaxy. And some of these galaxies are over 10 billion light years away. And the most amazing thing about this picture is that just, just if you hold a grain of sand up against the sky, that grain of sand is encompassing the same area as we see here in this picture. It's a big universe the good Lord has. So anyway, it's so much fun to, to, to just show people uh, stuff through the telescope and look at all those stars is just, to me, it's a religious experience. It is really something. All right, let's talk constellations here. Now, one of the things I love to do when I'm doing star parties is to actually show constellations, but I like to preview them. But I'm gonna preview some of them here. I'm not gonna go through every single one of them. And then what I wanna do is show you how to use those star maps. And then I wanna have time for some question and answers. Sound like a plan? So you know where I'm going here. I'm just, just not going to talk on and on and on. Okay, all right. I've been accused of that by my bosses at CCO. Now, how many of you have seen the Big Dipper before? Well, I've asked you that. Okay. Now, constellations are a group of stars that allegedly make pictures. The problem with most constellations is they don't really look like what they're supposed to be. You have to put your imagination into overdrive. Now, constellations were used by people a long time ago to help tell their stories or their mythology. They're soap operas in the sky. Uh, most of the stories that I know about and probably are best known around here are the ones that come from Greek and Roman mythology. How many of you are up on your Greek and Roman mythology? The gods and the goddesses with a small g. You've got to know the names of these dudes if you're ever going to do a big crossword puzzle. All right? You, do, you, you know what I mean? If you do crossword, who's the king of the gods with a small g? Zeus, and he's tall, dark, and handsome, and very, very conceited. His, uh, his wife isn't much better. Qu the queen of the gods, they both live on Mount Olympus. Her name is Hera. Oh, you guys know. The, and she is also, she's also very mischievous and gets into all kinds of trouble. And if you've ever done any reading on mythology, you know what I'm talking about. I want to keep this a family program. All right. Um, uh, and, uh, and, and on top of all that, she's got a horrible temper. And then there's other gods and goddesses, like Apollo, the god of the sun. He leads a team of horses pulling a cart with the sun in, sky, in the sky, and they fly from the east to the west. His sister Artemis does the same thing with the moon. Some of the gods are known better by their Roman names, like the goddess of love, who is... Venus, her uh, Greek name is Aphrodite. Then you got Poseidon, the god of the sea. And does anybody know who the goddess of wisdom is? Athena. You know who the male god of wisdom is? You don't because there wasn't one. So even back then, <laughs> even back then, guys were put in their place. And hopefully I'll get a chance to tell you a few of these stories. I, I gotta tell you at least one constellation story. I love doing that. I tell lots of them in the book. And I gotta tell you, I've got another book coming out in, in the summertime through Adventure Publications out of Cambridge. Uh, and I'm actually, I'm gonna have an MP3 download available with that book where I tell these constellation stories. I love doing it. Well, anyway, uh, let's get to these constellations here. Uh, actual constellations themselves. Some are big, some are small, some are bright, and some are dim. All right, now I'm gonna take a little survey here. How many of you, if we were to make, make it dark now, take my green laser pointer, how many of you could show me 15 constellations? Anybody? Anybody? And you live in the country? Shame on you. No, I'm kidding. How many of you could find 10 constellations? Okay, this is like an auction reverse. How about five constellations? How about three? How about two? How about one? And what would that one be? I got bad news for you. It's not a constellation. It's not. No, all by itself it's not. What it is, it's the rear end and the tail of a bigger constellation called by its Latin name, Ursa Major, or in English, the Big Bear. Why do I have the Big Bear up on his tail? Because that's how you see it this time of year. You go out tonight, you look in the Northeast, that's how you're going to see the Big Bear. How many of you have seen the entire Big Bear in the sky? Have you seen it? All right, it's really not that hard to see. Now, it is a big constellation. So once you've found the Big Dipper, you've seen a big uh, chunk of real estate in the sky. 
All right, you know how big the Big Dipper is. So here's, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to give you actual, another assignment here. I want you to look for the Big Dipper, okay? No problem. What I want you to do is look above the pot section of the Big Dipper for three dimmer stars that make a skinny triangle. Now these are going to be a little dimmer than the stars in the Big Dipper, but see if you can see those three stars that make that skinny little triangle. That's the head of the bear. And by the way, those numbers you see, those are the distances to the stars and light years. Stars have funny names. I like the one here at the eye called Musida. It sounds like something you take for nasal congestion. So you look for these three stars that make up the, the head, and then look to the right of that, and they, they will catch your attention. Look just to the right of the uh, triangle, and you'll see two stars right next to each other. They'll jump out at you. Talitha and El Capra, that's the front paw of the bear. Now in between those two stars, and the triangle, there'll be a star in between. That's the bear's knee. And you've seen his front leg. He doesn't have another front leg. I don't know what happened. He has two rear legs, although the rear leg in the background, so fate, don't bother with it. But the rear leg in the foreground, you can see. And just like the front paw, there's two stars here that make up his rear paw. And then from there, you go down and to the left, one star, two stars, back up to Fecta at the rear end of the bear, or the rear end of the pot section, and you got the big bear. You got this straight now? Big Dipper, the triangle for the head, front paw, front leg, back paw, back leg. See if you can shoot, find it. Okay, now, where there's a big bear in the sky, there's a little bear. And the key to finding the little bear or the, or the little dipper is to find Polaris, the North Star, all right? Polaris is a very important star because it's shining directly above the Earth's North Pole. And every single star in the sky seems to go around the North Star uh, because it's shining above the North Pole. We're seeing a reflection in the sky of the Earth's rotation. Well, the way to find the North Star in the sky is very easy. It's not the brightest star in the sky, but it's easy to find. Take the two stars on the side of the pot opposite the handle and go from Mirac to Doobie. Keep that line going, you know, make it, use it as a pointer and keep that line going three fist widths at arm's length. And you do that and you'll get right to Polaris. Oh, by the way, my daughter does my artwork. I gotta brag on my kid. All right, uh, Polaris is the last star in the handle of the Little Dipper, which isn't as bright as the Big Dipper. It's also the Little Bear. They're one and the same. Now, the Little Dipper is not nearly as bright as the Big Dipper, but in the countryside, no problem. Look for Polaris, and then look for the next two brightest stars you see below it, uh, Coal Cab and Per Cab, and then see if you can see the other two pot stars and the other two handle stars. Might be a little tricky. Just a couple more constellations here, and then I want to show you how to use the star maps. This is also in the northern sky. Have you seen Cassiopeia, the queen, that W up there? That's supposed to be a queen tied up in her throne going, no! And I gotta tell you the story about that in a bit. Uh, now, she looks like a W. Now, Cassia, or her husband Cepheus, doesn't look like a king. He looks like a house with a really steep roof. So look for this, cat, look for this uh, sideways uh, W, which is Cassiopeia in the northwestern sky, and then below it and to the left, Look for a constellation that looks like a house with a steep roof. That's Cepheus. And guys, all remember this, in all aspects, the queen is always brighter than the king. Cassiopeia will be brighter than the king. So see if you can spot that. And these are all on your star maps too. Um, and, and they're in the northwestern sky. And then just other, another one I want to mention, I'm skipping ahead here a little bit, is, ooh, I'm gonna see if this will work. I can always have, oh, there we go again. Try it one more time. Oh, forget it. Okay, I was trying to show you a picture of the constellation Orion, but I think outside of the Big Dipper, this is probably really familiar, isn't it? The constellation Orion. I love, love this part of the sky. And it's in the winter, and it's directly south, and it's wonderful. You've got the bright constellation Orion, and you've got all kinds of other bright constellations and stars around it. I call this part of the sky Orion and his gang. What I tell people if they live in the city, whatever you do, Bundle up, go in the countryside, and look at this part of the sky in the winter. It is breathtaking. You live in the country, you know what I mean? It is really breathtaking. Just an absolutely wonderful thing. What catches your eye are the three stars in a row that make up this belt, El Nitak, El Nilam, and Tonka. And believe it or not, physically, they have nothing to do with each other. Absolutely nothing to do with each other. They just happen to show up from our vantage on Earth to be in that straight line. Coincidence or not? And then you've got Rigel, its brightest star at its knee, and now up here, Betelgeuse. Oh, now the picture decided to work. There it is here. Well, I might as well show you the picture. That's Betelgeuse. 
And Betelgeuse has a distinctly reddish glow to it. That's what we call a super red giant star. Now our sun will become a red giant when it starts to run out of hydrogen fuel in about five billion years, but it's not gonna be this big because Betelgeuse was the big star to begin with. This star at times could be almost a billion miles in diameter. It's the biggest single thing you've ever seen. Eventually it's gonna blow up and become a supernova and what's left of it will become a, uh, a black hole. And this could happen in the next thousand years or the next million years. Astronomers really don't know. Now the fun part about, about Betelgeuse is it's an Arabic name which means the armpit of the Great One. You are looking at Orion's armpit. And just one more thing I got to talk about. If you look below the belt of Orion, you'll see three more stars in a row, and that's Orion's sword. But even to the naked eye, you see that the middle star is kind of fuzzy. And that's because it's what we call a nebulae. It's an emission nebulae. And you won't see the colors like this when you look at it through a telescope, but even with a pair of binoculars, you'll see the general uh, shape of it. It's a big cloud of hydrogen gas about 1,500 light years away and about 26 light years across. And it's within this cloud of gas that stars are being born. And um, you'll notice four stars, this is kind of overexposed in this picture, but you'll notice four stars right in the middle of it in a trapezoid. They're young stars that are so bright that they're causing the rest of this cloud to glow like a fluorescent light. It's really something to see. Well, I could go on and on and on here, and there's so much I could show you. But uh, one thing I want to do before I start taking questions is, uh, and I got to tell you a story too. Have, uh, can I borrow somebody's star map? But I, want, I don't want to take anybody, I, I'm so ill prepared. Can you guys share? Sure. Here, all right, just for now. Uh, don't fight now, okay? All right. How many of you have ever used a star map before to find your way in the night sky? Have you ever done it? Do you have good luck or bad luck? Okay, well some people have bad luck and it's not all your fault because there's a lot of lousy star maps out there. Okay, I'm gonna jump ahead here to the slide. I am jumping ahead here. I'm restraining myself. Okay, because there's so much I could show you. All right, now this is a map of the March skies. The skies change throughout the course of the year because the Earth is going around the sun. So I figure why give you the February map. So here's the March map. Now, doesn't the sky to you seem like a big bowl of stars over your head? Doesn't it seem like a big bowl of stars? Well, we know it's not actually a bowl of stars, but for directional purposes and mapping purposes, we're gonna make it a bowl of stars, all right? And if you look at the outer edge of the circle, well, that's the horizon. And you look along the horizon, you see the various directions, north, south, east, and west. And then in the middle would be the overhead or the zenith. And the idea of this thing is to hold the map up over your head and go from the map to the sky. Now, I don't wanna borrow that chair, uh, but the best way, the best way, you know what, I'm going to sit right here, is that okay? The best way to watch the stars is to sit back and relax. You don't want to be walking around, because that's going to get old. Find a lawn chair, find a comfy lawn chair, and do this in the wintertime. Your neighbors are going to think you're nuts, but who cares? All right, oh, forgot something, i got to get something. So you want to sit back in a chair, and before you start stargazing, Give yourself a good 15 minutes or so to get used to the darkness. It makes such a difference. And if you want to, lie back on the ground. I'm 55 years old, I'm not lying back on the ground anymore. But like a chase lounge, and give yourself a good 15 minutes to get used to the darkness. Now you're sitting in the dark and you gotta see the star map. You gotta have a flashlight. Best thing is a headband flashlight. You can pick these up at Wally Mart for like 15 bucks or some other places. But you don't wanna use a white light. Because if you use a white light in these maps, guess what's gonna happen to your night vision that you've been working to get? Bye-bye. So you wanna get a light that switches to red, okay? And you do that, you can still see the map and keep your night vision. All right, I wanna give you an example of how these work. Now, I'm gonna kinda of face your way. Can we, can we assume we're facing north? Okay, I'm a weatherman with a license to lie. I don't know if that, you know, is that actually north? I'm telling, a weatherman's telling you the truth? Oh my God. All right, well, all right, so let's all face north. In fact, can I sit next to you? Sure. I'm gonna sit next to you, and that way you can see the map. Okay, I want you all to take your star maps and hold them out in front of your face, upside down. Upside down, okay? And then raise them up over your head. All right, and when you do that, the north point on the horizon of your map 
will face north. You see? You see that? And that how that works? Okay, and then you look what you want to find in the northern sky. And in the northeastern sky, there's the big bear. You see the big dipper and the big bear. And then there's the little dipper below it. You could use the pointers from the big dipper, uh, big dipper's pot section. And then over in the northwest, there's Cassiopeia and Cepheus. Remember those two? Well, you find what you want to find in the northern sky. Then when you're done with the northern sky, you have to get up out of your chair and say, if that's north, then that would be west, right? Well, say you choose to face west. So you sit down and you face west and you hold the maps up so the west point on the map faces west and you look for stuff in the western sky. By the way, you see Jupiter and Venus there? Uh, on March 13th, they're gonna be really close. And then when you're done with the, uh, when you're done with the uh, 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 western sky, you hold the map up so the south point of the map faces south. And there's Orion and his gang. There's just so many cool stars and constellations around there and they're all easy to find. And then when you're done with the western or with the southern sky, hold them up and face east and look at the eastern sky. And honestly, there isn't a whole bunch in the eastern sky except a constellation called Leo the Lion that looks like a backwards question mark. And below that question mark a little ways, do you see Mars? So you guys got a lot to do. You guys got a lot to do. And that's why I wanted to, when I set up this, this, uh, this uh, talk with John, I wanted to make sure that you guys were able to take something from it. And I want you to take something from it. Okay, I'm trying to stick to time here. We're running a little late here. I have to tell you one of these stories. Can I tell you one of these quick stories before I open it up to questions? Let me switch back here. Okay, now I've become completely disorganized. I've lost my switcher. It's in my pocket. Oh, there it is. Probably gonna step on it here before too long. All right, there's a lot of stories I could tell you, but let me just tell you one. Oh, I'm going the wrong way. We're taking a trip through space. Oh, by the way, I, as long as I'm at it, I gotta tell you about this. When you're looking at Orion, when you're looking at Orion, take the belt of Orion and look down to the lower left of it, you'll run into a seriously bright star called Sirius. That's the brightest star in the sky because it's so close, it's only eight light years away. But it's also the brightest star in Canis Major. It's the nose of Canis Major, and it looks like the dog is kind of begging for food. He's standing up there. Uh, just to the upper left of him is a bright star called Perseon. Perseon and Gomaza is all there is to a constellation called the Little Dog. I call it the Wiener Dog. All right. But here's what I wanted to show you. Go from Betelgeuse to Sirius to Perseon, and you have a perfect triangle. It's called the Winter Triangle. Isn't that cool? It's just absolute, and again, it's just the way they happen to lie from Earth. All right, now let me tell you a quick story here. And once again, I'm going backwards. Story of my life. A dyslexic weatherman, not a good thing to have. Okay, here, oh, there's Angie again. Okay, here we go. Here we go. Ah, there's where I want to be. I got to tell you a story about how Cassiopeia and Cepheus got up in the sky. I'll, I'll give you the Reader's Digest version here. Cassiopeia and Cepheus were the king and queen of ancient Ethiopia. I have to warn you, I like to modernize these stories just a little bit, all right? But I don't have to do it so much with this one. Cassiopeia and Cepheus were the king and queen of ancient Ethiopia. And they loved each other very much. They were kissy face all the time, but they were two different personalities. And how many times, you know, they say opposites match. Now, Cepheus was, was the nicest, easiest going guy you could ever meet. He could care less about being king. He'd rather be your buddy. He, in fact, he went off with his buddies every day, golfing or fishing or, or whatever. He, didn't, he went up to the ball game, went to a doubleheader. He had a good old time. He could care less about being king. Meanwhile, his wife Hera, or Hera, I'm screwing these up. His wife Cepheus really took this king thing seriously, this queen thing seriously. And she liked to exercise her power, and she was so vain. And she would walk around the streets of her kingdom with her entourage and bodyguards and go up to people and say, am I the most beautiful woman you've ever seen? And if you didn't jump up and down and say, oh, yes, my queen, you were fed to the dragon. Okay, so, uh, and there's many other stories about her vanity. In fact, she almost got the entire kingdom devoured by a sea monster because she insulted Poseidon, the god of the sea, said that she was more beautiful than his wife and all 10 of his daughters and Poseidon made the sea monster and just about had the kingdom destroyed but they got out of that mess and that's a whole different story. They almost had to sacrifice their daughter, Princess Andromeda, to do it but again, that's a whole other story. Well anyway, the point of the matter is Cassiopeia was extremely vain and one day she, was, she went too far. 
she shook her fist in the direction of Mount Olympus and she said, I'm so beautiful, I'm even more beautiful than Hera. And you know what happened? Hera got flaming mad and she came storming down from Mount Olympus and she said, I'm going to find this Cassiopeia. Wait a minute, I think I have found her. Are you Cassiopeia the Queen? Are you Cassiopeia the Queen? Okay. You are Cassiopeia the Queen? Yes. Turn around. Isn't she, love, isn't she a lovely queen? Look at her. It's, you know what? I heard it said that you think you're more beautiful than me. Is that true? You really are pretty. You know, can, I, can, I can't really get behind you that easy, but can I give you a shoulder rub? All right, let me straighten out your crown. Let me straighten out your crown, and I'm going to rub your shoulders. Oh, do you like having your shoulders rubbed, queen? Oh, you know what happens when somebody gives you a really good shoulder rub? What happens? You start falling asleep, right? Like many of you are doing right now. But you start falling asleep. And once she's asleep, out come the ropes and chains. She ties up, she ties up Cassiopeia, throws her into the sky and says, you think you're so beautiful? Why don't you hang up there in the sky for the entire time and show the entire world how beautiful you are? So ever since then, She's been tied up there in that throne going, no! Now, her husband Cephas came home from the golf course that day. He really loved his wife, and he was distraught. And it so happens that one of his buddies was Zeus, the king of the gods. And he begged Zeus, I can't go on living like this. I have to go up there with her. Please throw me up there. And he was afraid of throwing her up there because he was afraid of, of, of Cassia. Uh, he was afraid of Hera. Do you blame him? But finally, he begged and begged and said, okay, come on, put your foot in my hands, come on. All right, here you go, on the count of three, one, two, three, whoosh. And he throws Cepheus with pinpoint precision right up next to his wife, and to this night and day, the lovers are together. Aw, isn't that a nice story? And there's other stories that don't have such happy endings as well. Well, it's almost 10.15, and I'm trying to keep this on time. Uh, believe me, I've been abbreviating my comments as much as I can. But again, I wish I could just magically take you out there and show you stuff in the nighttime sky. Oh, I almost forgot. I, I got my big telescope here with me. Um, this is a telescope. I actually have a couple like it. This is called a Newtonian reflector telescope. Now, who do you suppose invented the Newtonian reflector telescope? Sir Isaac Newton. Now. When people think of telescopes, they think of telescopes that you look through, okay? Those are called refractors, and those are fine. Now, I don't want to go into the whole, the whole thing about buying a telescope, but I will ask you this. Do you want me to be nice, or do you want me to be honest? If you're going to buy a telescope, don't, go, don't buy it at Walmart, Kmart, Sam's Club, or Target. They're great stores, lousy places to buy telescopes. Most department, tele most department store telescopes are junk. And if you pay less than $200, you're going to get what you pay for. Um, what I recommend is get a smaller version of this kind of telescope. Uh, there's one, and I, if you want to write this down or ask me later, there's one I recommend. I'm not advertising for it. It's called the Orion and Telescope. It's a small version of this for about $550. You will love it. Now, this is called a reflector telescope because it collects light with a mirror. Can you all see that mirror there, more or less, if I swing it around, you see that mirror? That's 20 inches wide, and that's parabolic. And that is the eyeball for this scope. Now, this seems like a dumb question, but how do you gather light into your eyes? Through your pupils, right? Okay, the good Lord made your pupils very efficient at gathering light. As small as they are, they do a very good job. In fact, they're more efficient than this, than this telescope. Except what trumps your eyeball is that the telescope here has got a 20 inch wide mirror. Now, the most important thing a telescope can do for you is gather light. Magnification power, that just depends on the eyepiece you're using. The more light gathering you have, the clearer the image is going to be and the higher magnification you can use and yet still have a clear image. Most of the time, I don't go over about 200 power. All right, and so what happens is light bounces off that mirror and the most intense part of the reflection is right here at the focal point. At the focal point, you have a flat mirror at a diagonal, at a 45 degree angle, that takes the image of the focal point out through a hole in the telescope, and then in that hole, you put an eyepiece, and you focus it. And you use some kind of aiming device to help you find stuff. 
and that's how you use it. And again, this is a 20 inch scope. The one I recommend, the Orion SkyQuest and Telescope, and just look it up online, is, um, is about uh, is eight inches in diameter. Now, you could spend a little bit more money on telescopes and get them to do all kinds of fun stuff. Um, I have on this a little computer. It's called GoTo, and I can actually uh, have it go to any object I want it to. In fact, I'm going to have it go to a beautiful star cluster in the constellation Gemini. Okay, I knew that would happen because I've been jacking around with it too much. There it goes. Look, Mom, no hands. Isn't that cool? It's looking for the uh, M35, which is a beautiful open star cluster of young stars in the constellation Gemini. It's creaking along. When's it going to stop? Anytime. By the way, I have another one just like this. Negotiations with my wife get hot and heavy sometimes when it comes to this stuff. Mikey and his toys. Okay, it's still looking for it. Where to go? It should stop any time. It should stop any time. And it just did. Okay, so I had to line it up using dummy coordinates, and that's how I found Now, you can get some telescopes that have GPS and everything else in them, so it's a lot of fun. Well, I am starting to go over time a little bit, but hey, you having fun? I'm having fun. Does anybody have any questions at all about anything? Stargazing? I love to have you come to one of my star parties, and to find out when and where they're going to be, go on my website, easy to remember, lynchandthestars.com. I, I have it on my business cards in the table where I'm selling books. Oh, yeah. Yes, sir. Uh, on your map, you show the constellation Auriga as the bird? Yeah, it's a weird one. Uh, look at your maps. It's, it, it's like right in the middle. It's almost overhead. This one, I think there was a big party coming, going on when they invented this one. It looks like a lopsided pentagon and is supposed to be a retired chariot driver turned goat farmer. This is one of the stories. Retired chariot driver turned goat farmer. And right where the bright star capella is, he has a mama goat on his shoulders. And if you look at it, you'll see three stars that make a little triangle right by capella. Those are baby goats or kids. And that, that is a wild one. What, what was your question about it? Well, charioteer, because he was a re he's a retired chariot driver, okay. turned goat farmer, and that's why it's called a Riga. Good question. Anybody else? Yes. What do you think about the Pluto? I think they should leave Pluto alone and let it be a planet. How many of you think the same thing? <laughs> leave it alone. Now, scientifically, yeah, I understand. There are bodies beyond Pluto that are actually bigger than Pluto. And what are you going to do? Make more planets? or change your classification. Well, all right, in principle, I think, yeah, the Pluto's not really, should be really a minor planet, but for gosh sakes, is there a little bit of room for tradition in science? And you know, the cruelest thing they did, you know who invented, the, the, you know who invented, or uh, invented, you know who actually saw Pluto for the first time? A fellow by the name of Clyde Tomba in 1929, okay? He passed away, I'm not sure when, but, when the astronomical community decided to take away Pluto, he was gone, but guess who was still around? His wife. Couldn't they have waited for his wife to pass before they took away her husband's planet? I mean, come on. I, I, you know, again, it makes sense, but isn't there a little room for tradition? That's how I feel. Okay, anybody else? Uh, yes? Do you like how you see through that one? Well then, if that's the case, I think I just got ripped. <laughs> that's when you have a ladder. <laughs> and let me tell you a story about this. I actually wanted to get a scope bigger than this for my star parties, but my wife talked me out of it because she said, that's as big as you want to get, because you get anything bigger, uh, moms and dads are going to kind of be leery about having kids go up on a ladder like that. So that's probably as big as you want it. Yes. Anybody else? Yes. Uh, through a telescope? Oh gosh, galaxies. Uh, galaxies and, and are, are really cool, cool to look at and nebulae. 
The Orion Nebulae is wonderful. Uh, the planet Saturn is absolutely gorgeous. Saturn will be coming into view here in the evening sky uh, along about April. But one of the prettiest things I like looking at, I love looking at open star clusters, which are groups of young stars that have all formed together. The, the classic star cluster that you can see with the naked eye, and I know you've all seen it, it's called the Pleiades, or the Seven Little Sisters, and it looks like a little dipper. In Japan, it's called Subaru. Did you know that? Subaru was emerging as seven small car companies in Japan in the 1950s, and they adapted that cluster as their symbol. And to this day, you see, you see uh, stars on the grills of Subaru cars, and that's where it came from. But open star clusters, they're beautiful, because you see different colors of stars in them. Some are big, some are small, some have a little nebulosity around them. They're, they're just gorgeous. But uh, my absolute favorite thing to look at is Saturn. It's just wonderful. Sometimes you can see the shadow of, of Saturn's ring right on the planet. So it's fun. It's fun. Yes? Uh, yes, with the James Webb Telescope, uh, and unfortunately, uh, we, politically and economically, this is a bad time for science and astronomy, a very bad time. Programs are being cut, but at least the, the, uh, the, the, the James Webb Telescope is still online to be launched in, in 2015. And they, uh, I tell you, the, the, w some of my heroes are those astronauts and the crews and the technicians on Earth that managed to rescue the Hubble telescope and keep it going all these years. Uh, some of those pictures are just fantastic. They are, but I have to warn you a little bit about some of those pictures. And this is, I'm not trying to make controversy, but you see all those colors and everything. A lot of times that's false color and there's good reason for that. Uh, but a lot of times people get the idea that that's actually the color that you see and it's not always, but despite that, Tremendous, tremendous pictures. And nobody's trying to pull the wool over your eyes. You just, you just have to understand that. Anybody else? Yes? Speaking down about the problem of light pollution. Well, it's there. Um, I, you know, I, I, I admire valiant people who try to fight against it. Uh, but I, I just, you know, I, I hate to throw in the towel and say it's hopeless. But in the big urban areas, I don't know what you're going to do. But there's little things you can do. Uh, and one of the things that bothers me are street lights that shine up into the air. They don't need to shine up in the air. In Arizona, there's a law that says that street lamps have to be shaded so they only shine on the ground. Uh, but you know, I, I just don't see how you're going to get people to cooperate and turn off lights. It's just, it, it's sad, but that's the way it is. Uh, and somebody was telling me a story about they had this place off in, in the countryside and this fellow next to him, beautiful dark countryside, puts in a street lamp and just screws up everything. And finally the guy moves out and they're able to turn off the street lamp. Why they do that? I understand their safety concerns, but come on, I love the night sky. Uh, I wish I could say rah, rah, you know, go for it, but I, I have to be a little bit discouraged. I'm afraid you just have to travel in the countryside. But even having said that though, take your star maps even in the cities, if you go back into a dark part of your backyard and give yourself a good 15 to 20 minutes to get used to the darkness, you will see things, right, but not as well as you will in the country. On the other hand, if you go deep in the countryside and there's stars everywhere, that's a bad place to learn the constellations because then it's overkill, but it's gorgeous. Okay, yes? Well, I would have to say there's lots of them. I'd say in the United States, any place around southern Arizona, the Kitt Peak area, which is about 75 miles west of Tucson. Every year I go down to Arizona to stargaze. And it's not just the fact that the skies are clear so often, it's also the fact that they're very transparent. There's very low humidity, skies are like super duper clear. However, in Minnesota, you have the same clarity in the skies when it's clear in the winter time, but you gotta dress up for it. Uh, but Arizona, I'd say really Arizona, although I've never traveled there, but I've heard that, that in parts of, of North Africa, the skies are just absolutely pitch. And I do want to put in a pitch as well for the Minnesota Astronomical Society. I'm glad you brought that up. Well, you didn't bring that up particularly, but you reminded me of it. The Minnesota Astronomical Society, I'm a member, and they have star parties mainly around the Twin Cities, but they have another observatory up in Long Lake, Minnesota, or the, uh, Long Lake Conservation Reserve, Near, uh, near McGregor and Aiken, and go to their website or browse in Minnesota Astronomical Society, 
and they have star parties and I'm a member and they're fun to go to people set up telescopes and it's just a good good time mainly around the Twin Cities there's an observatory near Norwood Young America there's another one down by Denison Minnesota we're actually actually down closer to Faribault and that's where you could really see some things anybody else I suppose we better wrap it up here pretty quick yes Oh, I thought you'd never ask. Uh, I get a couple of big guys. No, actually, it all breaks down. This is just a shroud to keep out light. And these are truss supports. I take the top off, and then the truss supports come off. And I'm left with the mirror box, and I take the mirror out of the box. And outside of maybe these, you know, the supports, I can collapse this down to like a 2 by 3, uh, rec uh, a two by three uh, cube, something like that. And so it all breaks down, and it's very, very easy. I have no idea how much it weighs all together because it all comes together in pieces. I can get this thing up, and I can knock this thing down in 10 minutes. And to put it up and to have it aligned takes about a half hour or so. So it's not that big of a deal. And, uh, and that's the thing. But uh, it's, it's not exactly portable, but it is. All right. And oh, another thing with telescopes, as long as I'm, I'm thinking of it, and so important, and so many people make this mistake. When you're going to use a telescope or any other kind of optical device outside, you have to let the optics sit outside a good half hour, 40 minutes. They have to acclimate to the temperature outside. If they don't, you're going to get a fuzzy image. Classic example of this, somebody gets a telescope, it's under the Christmas tree, they whip it outside, put it up, everything's fuzzy, and they take it back to the store thinking they got a bad telescope. May not be the case. You've got to let it acclimate. Eyepieces and everything. So important. All right. Did I answer your question? Okay, okay, yes. Anybody else? Yeah. Um, why can't we see cancer on here? Cancer is a very, very faint constellation. Very faint. Now, and it's very fine print there, but between Gemini and Leo, there's something called the Beehive Cluster. And that's another open cluster of stars. That cluster is actually brighter than the stars in, in Cancer. Cancer is a very dim constellation. Very, very dim. You need to really. Yes. Yes, Queen. <laughs> Yes. Do you have um, a star um, night thing coming around this area? Where we um, you know, I don't think I have one. Any, I, I was up, up in the, uh, I think it was the Al Albany area back last fall. I can't think of anything. I have done them before in, um, oh, what's that little town near Little Falls? Uh, remember, I'm having a senior moment. Um, I can't think of it. But I, I do do them in this area. I can't honestly think, and I suppose I should have looked before I came here today, but check my website, lichinthestars.com. I could go through my calendar right now, but I don't think you want me to do that. All right, Come, one, more, one more question. Are we done? Okay, oh, oh, you got one, go for it. Uh, condensation is a problem. Um, dust, actually on the mirror, dust can be a problem. But I don't like the dust to build. I don't like to clean it too often. And when I do clean it, I use distilled water. I, you know, anytime you rub it, you, you, you take off a little bit of the uh, aluminizing. What lenses, a general, general rule of thumb, when you're cleaning all eyepieces or mirrors or whatnot, use distilled water. You won't get the deposits. Don't use like a Windex. Don't use like what you use on your glasses. Use distilled water. And uh, condensation can be a bit of a problem. In the wintertime, in fact, I had a star party um, up by Princeton, and in the wintertime what happens is people go up there and they look through the eyepiece and it's like super cold, and they'll look at Saturn and go, whoa, look at that! And when they do that, it frosts up the eyepiece. So I'm right there with my rag, and you know, I'm not going to tell people not to breathe, but that's about the only time that happens, when it gets super duper cold. Just don't go up there and hopefully it'll take your breath away. Okay, well guys, unless anybody else has any other questions, thank you. I really enjoyed being here and I hope you enjoyed it. Thank you. Appreciate it.